Hi everyone, my name is Joe Bott. I'm a senior biochemistry major at Union College. I'm joining you today for my biochemistry research lab where I work under Professor Brian Cullen. Some of our research involves the studying of intracellular communication, or simply put, we look at the talking that goes on inside of a cell between the different parts inside of it. Like us, cells also have organs inside themselves that are crucial for their survival. We have heart, the lungs, and the liver, Inside of cells, they have mitochondria, a nucleus, and a Golgi apparatus, for example. I'm going to introduce these more at the end of the video, but right now I want to focus on something else. As you may recall from the first video, a cell is the smallest unit of life. It's the smallest possible living thing. So I wanted to make this video because I would bet that you haven't taken much time to consider why a scientist might study cells. So today I want to take a step back and ask you some important questions. First, why do we study cells? I already gave you the reasons why I study cells. So after considering reasons why scientists study cells, I wanna try and teach you some basic observations that a scientist might make when they're trying to study cells. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a better understanding of how a scientist approaches study, as how a scientist would approach studying cells and how this might help us study larger issues like developing a COVID-19 vaccine. So again, I made a PowerPoint presentation Bear with me, I'll bring it up and we can go through it. So we're gonna present, hopefully, maybe not there. Let's present like this, great. So let's look at cells today. So why do we study cells? What are some specific benefits to studying cells? Well, we study cells in order to develop vaccines, like I said, we can use these to understand how our immune system allows us to gain immunity after receiving a vaccine. We study cells to understand how our body is able to process and break down food that we eat in order to convert that into energy we use to survive. We can also use cells to study and understand genetic components behind disease. We, in addition, we can study cells in a genetic sense. We can look at the genetics to understand the likelihood that some babies might be born with the same or different genetic conditions or disorders uh, than their parents. So there's lots of reasons to study cells. So why do we study cells? We answered, so how can we study cells? That's the question. So we must first ask a question. We must know what we wanna learn. So today let's ask, what are some characteristics of eukaryotic cells? Well, this is a college term, eukaryotic cells. What's that mean? Well, the eukaryotic cell is just a type of cell. Eukaryotic cells are a type of cells that are in us. We're eukaryotic organisms. So these are the most complex or more complex, I would say, in, uh, in reference to uh, the other type of cell, a prokaryotic cell. So we don't have to concern ourselves with the differences, but I just wanted to point out that there are different types of cells. So how can we make observations on the smallest unit of living things? Let's move on. So here uh, we have Robert Hooke. He discovered he made he discovered cells using microscope. So we can use a microscope to study cells, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to sell, see cells with our eyes. They're way too small. We need a way for us to see them. So what was his method? He used a microscope. This is a microscope that he would use. We wouldn't see a microscope like this in our lab today. They're all electronic microscopes and they're much smaller and a little bit better built. We're not gonna use an oil lamp, we'll use a light bulb, but uh, this is what he would have used. And what he did was he used his microscope to look at corks or here's some corks that you know people use to seal wine bottles or different flasks inside of a lab. And a fun fact is upon observing the cork, he made up that these corks are made up of uh, dead uh, plant cells and he, coined the term cell because this is what he saw. And this reminded him of uh, different rooms called cells that monks uh, studied in um, when they were practicing their religious beliefs. Um, so that's where the term cell comes from. So I mentioned in my lab that we look at intercellular communication or talking that goes on inside of a cell. Um, and for, for me to study cells or for, my, for people in my lab to study cells, we need to grow cells first. So the cells we grow are HEK293R cells. So what does this mean? So this means that they are HEK293, they're mouse kidney cells, they're 
kidney cells from a mouse that have been modified to express a specific protein, uh, or in this case, a receptor, an R, which is just a type of protein. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, but my point being, we're, we're literally able to take mouse cells and make them make a protein, produce a protein um, found in grasshoppers. This receptor is found in grasshoppers and a lot of organisms, but this one in particular is from grasshoppers in order to better understand a process that occurs in humans. So using mouse, mouse kidney cells with a grasshopper protein to understand something that happens in us, isn't that, that's pretty crazy. So looking at this picture, um, we can see these cells growing. And as a scientist, I want you to look at this to try to understand a bigger picture. Ask yourself some simple questions. So what are the shape of these cells? Are they round? Are they square? Do they have lighter or dark regions to them? Do they grow in clumps or do they grow evenly across the plate? So these are some questions you can be asking yourselves when we're looking at these new pictures, these other slides that I have here. So slide seven here. So pause this video right now and come up with some observations, keeping those questions I had in the back of your mind. So first thing, do you notice the color of the cells here? Uh, most likely some sort of stain was used. And what can we see was stained? So it looks like that they have some of these long pink strands, right, that are colored in pink. And what are these? It's almost, what does this look like to you? To me, it almost looks like a skeleton structure, you know, that it has been stained that the cell is using. So in fact, what's been stained in pink here is structures called microtubulars that are responsible for the overall structure of the cell. So what else do we notice that's been colored by the stain? We notice that this light green region that every cell contains. So it might be hard, you might not, you wouldn't be able to know this, you know, just looking at a pink or a, a green blob in a cell, but this is in fact the nucleus of the, of the cell that's growing, which contains all the genetic material, all the DNA that is responsible for making you, you. And, um, what else would we notice? We notice that these aren't growing in columns. These are kind of growing across the plate evenly. So these are just a few simple observations we could make. So moving on, so we need to adjust our method a little bit. So this picture wasn't used with a compound microscope that we saw Robert Hook use. This is actually taken with a scanning electron microscope, something you don't have to worry about, but it's a more advanced technique of looking at cells. So what can we see here? So we see a scanning electron microscope image of a cell that allows us to look inside the cell at its various organs or its organelles or miniature organs. So again, pause this video and see what you notice about the cell, if anything besides the obviously labeled parts. So there's one thing I wanna point out here. So membranes are so important. We notice that this cell has different components that are isolated from itself. We don't see, we see this defined region of the cell. We don't see just the cell, you know, kind of diffusing into its environment. It has a defined um, boundary to it. And even inside this defined boundary, we see more defined boundaries. We see an isolated region here, the nucleus, that's separated from the rest of the interior of the cell. We see looking at the mitochondria that that's also isolated from the interior region of the cell. So this observation comes up, makes us come up with even more questions. Well, why would a cell have these defined regions? What's important about it? Well, we can use an analogy from a human. Well, different regions of our body are different. If you look at our stomach, it has, it's way more acidic than our brain would be because our stomach has a different job than our brain. Our stomach helps to digest food. So it needs to be very acidic. Likewise, the environment inside this mitochondria is different than the, re than the environment inside the nucleus. The mitochondria is more acidic than the nucleus because its job is to produce energy, not to store the genetic information of the cell. So this is also something to keep in mind once you make an observation. Well, why do, why do you see what you see? So in this slide, I included a cartoon version of a cell with the organelles more defined. So I wanted to include this because it shows you another layer of complexity inside the cell that's not captured by the scanning electron microscope or it's a little bit easier to see in this picture. 
So if you go on to study cells further, you're going to learn how complex the inside of cell really is, and how incredible it is that so much stuff goes on to keep us alive. We see all the stuff here. Oh, excuse me. We see all the stuff that goes on. We see the nucleus again. We see the mitochondria with even more membranes inside the mitochondria. It has actually has a, a double membrane system here. We see the Golgi apparatus. We see lysosomes, all sorts of stuff that goes on. So this big picture, what are we studying this today? So let's look at this. The most simple unit of life I said is the cell. So if you take many cells and lump them together, you're gonna end up with tissue. You take a bunch of tissue and lump it together, you're gonna end up with an organ, such as a heart. And then all these organs together work and function in organ systems. And these organ systems are what allow the organism to survive. So if we as scientists notice or make observations about the cell the, at the cellular level, we can understand how this mutation or this, this um, defect in a cell might have larger implications by affecting the tissue, by affecting the organ, by affecting the organ system, and ultimately affecting the organism and what makes it sick. And by studying cells, we can also find out ways to make an organism um, to fix it, to come up with cures and different medications that we can take um, to cure some diseases. So our conclusions today, what can we do? So I wanted to remind you that uh, last time, so some of our, what are our conclusions today? Well, we really don't have any conclusions per se like last time, but I hope you, can, you saw how cool it was to study cells and how to make observations um, to understand a little bit better how cells work. Um, so if you come up with any questions um, or you come up with a topic that you want to hear a little bit more about, feel free to contact me. My email is here below and I uh, hope to make another video soon and thanks for watching everybody.